Good evening, and welcome to this sleep story. My name's Rafe, and tonight I'll be taking you on a journey through France at the beginning of the 20th century, written by the famous artist and travel writer Gordon Home. This evening, on the way to sleep, we'll be travelling from Evreux to Orléans, a journey of 144 miles, and as always, immersing ourselves in France's rich history and peaceful countryside. Before we set off on our journey, let's relax and get comfortable. You may notice your breath, gently breathing in and out as you prepare for a good night's sleep. You may notice your head and neck relaxing onto your pillow and your body relaxing into your mattress. You may even allow your eyes to drift closed if they haven't already. And so, now you're ready for a story that will help you to drift gently off to sleep in your own time we can begin. Evreux is a cathedral town with comparatively wide but very unassuming streets of old houses having their original charm generally hidden under a covering of plaster. Cavalrymen with horsehair falling from their helmets and the numerous clergy seem to make up a considerable proportion of the population. In walking through the town, one frequently comes to little canals which take the water of the river Riton in several directions in a similar fashion to the Stour at Canterbury. The spacious square in front of the Hotel de Ville is overlooked by public buildings whose new appearance might give one a wrong impression of the antiquity of the town if it were not for the beautiful belfry tower with a pinnacled spire standing in one corner. It was built in the latter part of the fifteenth century, and the bell, whose notes are frequently heard, was cast in 1406 and is nearly a century older than the tower, which was built in place of an earlier one. The museum in the same square is interesting on account of the Roman remains it contains found at the village of Vieilleuvreux a Roman site about four and a half miles to the west. From the museum, a short street, the Rue de l'Horloge, leads to the cathedral, whose lately restored spire appears above the roofs from nearly every point of view. From the eleventh right down to the nineteenth century, rebuildings or alterations have been taking place on the great church, and now, to the architect, as well as those who are interested in the history of France, there are the records in stone of the changes which those eight centuries have witnessed. The first Norman cathedral was burnt in 1119 by Henry I of England, who rebuilt the nave about twenty-six years later. During the fighting in Normandy in the time of Philippe Auguste, the church again suffered and the triforium of the nave was rebuilt about the middle of the thirteenth century. The present choir followed at the beginning of the fourteenth century. The west front is unique in being the only completely classic façade among all the cathedrals of France. It almost gives the feeling of the François I chateau by the Loire, the interior is a most inspiring example of pure French Gothic. In the chapels are several windows containing beautiful stained glass of the 14th and 15th centuries that in the south transept is 16th century. The bishop's palace on the south side of the cathedral can only be seen from the boulevard Chambaudouin, where its fortified exterior is washed by one of the canals of the Eton. It is an interesting building of the fifteenth century, and in 1603 was, for a time, the residence of Henri IV, whose famous victory at Ivry 
a few miles south of Evreux, is described at the end of this chapter. At the end of the Rue Josephine is the church of the Benedictine Abbey of saint Torin. The life story of that otherwise obscure worthy of the church is told in the windows of the choir, and one of them shows his successful attack on the devil who had entered the temple of Diana in Evreux. The sacristan will show the casket containing relics of the saint to those who ask permission. It is worth while to do so, as this silver gilt reliquary is one of the most sumptuous examples in existence of goldsmith's work of the thirteenth century. The choir, the tower, and part of the nave of St. Torin belong to the fifteenth century, and other portions a Romanesque work of the eleventh century. Evreux suffered the most terrible buffets in the unsettled period when Normandy was the battleground of England and France. Henry I burnt the town and John sold it to Philippe Auguste, regaining it treacherously after the release of Richard I. Philippe, however, having captured it, massacred a large proportion of the miserable townsfolk. It is generally believed that the Devereux family obtained their name from this Norman town. The road to Chartres goes southwards from Evreux over the hedgeless plain of Saint-André in a perfectly straight line. The hamlet of Thomas, with its little church with a spiky spire on the left, is passed through, and here and there another village is seen across the fields, but otherwise, for some eight miles the great plain stretches away to a flat horizon with so few features that one marvels how a peasant can find his way to the particular field he was working in on the previous day. There are no hedges, no roadside cottages, and scarcely a tree to serve as a guide to any particular square of the great patchwork of green and brown. On reaching the old town of Nunancourt, one goes over a level crossing and, turning to the left, goes through the street, getting a passing glimpse of the market house standing on wooden posts. Henry I chose this place to build a castle for the defence of Normandy, and in it an agreement was signed between Richard I and Philippe Auguste, by which those two kingly warriors promised not to molest one another's dominions while absent on the Crusades. Here also they arranged their respective shares in the Third Crusade. On leaving Nonancor, the River Arver is crossed, and about nine miles farther on one reaches the interesting town of Dreux. The most conspicuous feature is the Hotel de Ville, a large square tower-like building with slightly projecting circular turrets at each corner. It was built between 1512 and 1537 and is a most interesting example of the transition from flamboyant Gothic to classic forms. The tall conical roof is broken with dormers and ends in a bell turret. Inside there is a beautiful staircase, a Renaissance fireplace, several fine rooms, a library, and old armour. Built on the steep hill that dominates the town on the north side, where the ruins of the keep and towers of the castle dismantled in 1593 still stand, is the Chapelle Royale, erected in 1816 by the Duchesse d'Orléans. After suffering imprisonment and banishment during the Revolution, she returned to France in 1814 and resided at Ivry, a few miles to the north of Dreux. The tombs of her father and the princes of her family in the vaults of the old collegiate church at Dreux had been broken open during the Revolution, but certain pious folk having hidden the bones the Duchess decided to build a chapel in which they could be preserved. It was completed in 1820, and her son, Louis-Philippe, afterwards built a larger structure. Le Nôtre describes how Louis refused to have any assistance in the work of sorting up the confused heap 
of the bones of his ancestors. These poor dead people, he said, have already been sufficiently tormented. Leave me alone with them. And, shut up by himself for a great part of a night, he laid out the bones on cloths, measuring, examining, and sorting them by the light of a lamp. The tombs include those of the Duchesse d'Orléans, the foundress of the chapel, of Louis-Philippe and his queen and their young children, and the Duchesse de Bourbon-Condé, mother of the unfortunate Duc d'Enghien. The church of Saint-Pierre, with its odd-looking unfinished towers, has a somewhat severe interior, relieved by the beauty of its sixteenth-century glass, the nave is fifteenth century, and the choir and transepts twelfth or thirteenth. A holy water basin, or bénitier, of the twelfth century is of great interest, and so is the chapel on the south side of the nave, containing wall paintings of the inhabitants of the town who made the pilgrimage of St. James of Compostela, Santiago in Spain, during the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries. The beautiful ambulatory has graceful pillars without capitals, and the sounding board of the pulpit rests on palm tree supports, as at Louvier. During the Huguenot War, Dreux and its neighborhood was involved in heavy fighting. In 1562, the first pitched battle was fought near the town, the Catholic leaguers being led by Montmorency and François, Duc de Guise, and the Protestants by Coligny and Condé. Although the Catholics were successful, it was a closely fought battle in which four thousand perished, and both Montmorency and Condé were taken prisoners. When Henry of Navarre had become Henri IV, although still only recognized as king by a few of the provinces of France, he laid siege to Dreux in 1590, but retired a few miles northward to Ivry, in the plain of Saint-André, on the approach of the Catholic army under Mayenne, numbering about sixteen thousand. My friends, said Henri, as he fastened on his helmet, yonder is the enemy, here is your king, and God is on our side. If you should lose your standards, rally round my white plume, you will always find it in the path of honour and of victory. The fight began at ten in the morning, and in two hours the army of Mayenne was in full flight. Outside the town, the journey across the great agricultural plain is continued. There are still no hedges between the strips of green and brown, sometimes broken by distant belts of woodland, going away to the soft, blue horizons in heaving undulations. The first village passed is Marvie moutier brulé One can see the high-pitched green roof and small spire of its eleventh-century church on the left. Le boulé mivoy the next village, which also has a little twelfth to fifteenth-century church, consists of a very compact collection of uniformly low thatched or green tiled cottages and barns, practically surrounded by a wall, beyond which there is no sign of any habitation until the next village is in sight. Speeding southwards, there appears, right ahead on the horizon, at the end of a very straight perspective of road, an enormous building with two spires. There is nothing else in sight beyond a few low trees, and the stranger at once realises that he is approaching a building of the greatest consequence. It is the vast Gothic Cathedral of Chartres. On entering the town, by going to the right along the Rue de la Couronne, one reaches the Place des Epars, where the hotels are situated. When one is inside the moat and fragmentary ramparts, the vast Gothic church remains the paramount interest. In its fabric is the story of Chartres, and apart from the cathedral there is little to tell of the town's genesis. The cathedral began as a little church built over a grotto where the early missionaries from Rome had discovered a statue of the Virgin. It was venerated under the name Notre-Dame de Souterre, 
Quirinius, the Roman governor of the town, then called Autricum, in the time of the emperor Claudius, put a number of the early Christians to the sword and had their bodies thrown into a well called the Puy de saint Four. This interesting link with Gallo-Roman Chartres was lost in the 17th century and was only rediscovered in 1901. It can be seen in the crypt behind the altar of the Virgin. This crypt is the largest in France, and, next to St. Peter's at Rome and Canterbury Cathedral, it is the largest in the world. The crypt, says Mr. Cecil Hedlam in his story of Chartres, which everyone who goes there should procure and read, was not in origin a crypt, or a martyrium, or a meeting-house of prayer dug beneath the level of the soil, but a tiny church set on the crest of the hill and raised above the surface of the earth. It only became a crypt, properly so called, when it had been covered up and the surrounding soil raised by the debris and deposits of succeeding years, so that when the new church was built it was erected naturally upon the top of the old. The crypt consists of two lateral galleries which run from the western towers under the aisles of the upper church and form a horseshoe curve beneath the choir and sanctuary 366 feet long and 17 to 18 feet broad of two transepts, seven apsidal chapels and the martyrium which is under the choir of the upper church. The interior is memorable for its immensity and for the strange and almost crude crimsons and blues of the 12th and 13th century glass. The three 12th century windows are below the rows of the western end of the nave, where they survived the fire of 1194 almost by a miracle. Several of the windows were given by the trades of Chartres, from the armourers to the pastry cooks. By many, Chartres is considered the finest cathedral in France, and although there will occur to the mind the glories of the choir in Beauvais and of the name of Amiens, the interior of Chartres, in its reposeful vastness and strength as a complete structure built in one period, leaves all rivals far behind. The ambulatory screen is the most sumptuous piece of Renaissance carving in France. It was begun in 1514 by Jean de Beauce and completed in the 18th century. The lives of Christ and of the Virgin are illustrated in the series of pictures in stone. The Assumption of the Virgin of Carrara marble, carefully selected by Bridon the sculptor, was finished in 1773. At the Revolution it was saved by an architect who put a red cap of liberty on the head of the Virgin and a lance in her hand. The Vierge du Pilier is a figure of wood, painted and gilded, with an almost black face. It stands on a short pillar and is especially venerated by women, being a link with very early and primitive forms of worship. The Chapelle Saint-Pierre was built in 1349 at the east end and separate from the cathedral. A staircase and passage lead to it. The labyrinth of blue and white stone in the floor of the nave is a rare and interesting feature, and one of the best in existence. It is not properly known in what way these mazes were used, nor the rites connected with them, although it has been stated that instead of a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, a penitent could perform the six hundred feet journey of the maze on his knees. The treasury contains, in a modern reliquary, two pieces of white silk regarded as part of the tunic or veil of the Virgin which had been given to Charlemagne by the Empress Irene and was afterwards presented to Chartres by Charles the Bald. Saint-Pierre or Saint-Père-en-Valais The Abbey Church of Saint-Père-en-Valais, founded by Clovis, is a fine building dating from the 12th to the 14th century. It was commenced in 1150 under the direction of the monk Hilduar and almost entirely rebuilt in the 13th century. Of the earlier construction there remains the lower part of the choir with its heavy pillars, the aisles which surround the choir, 
and the chapels. The great square tower has been placed as early as 940, but may have been built a century later. The stained glass belongs to the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries, the earliest being in the choir excluding the apse. In the south aisle of the nave is the tombstone of Robert, Archbishop of Rouen, son of Richard I, Duke of Normandy. Saint-Agnon is mainly a Renaissance church, with the chief entrance built in the 14th century. The windows are the most interesting feature. Saint-Martin-Auval is the church of the ancient priory of the Abbey of Marmontier, and today the chapel of the Hôpital Saint-Brice, a curious building of the 12th century, incorporating some remains of a great basilica previous to the 10th century. The crypt contains some Roman capitals of marble, stone sarcophagi, and the tomb of a bishop of Chartres. Saint-André, an interesting ruined collegiate church, now a shop, built about 1108, over two square crypts belonging to early Christian times. There is a beautiful Romanesque door. saint foy is chiefly a flamboyant church. It was desecrated with great profanity in the Revolution and remained secular until it was reconsecrated in 1862. The Hotel de Ville is a Renaissance building, formerly the Hotel Montescot, 1614. It contains the museum of pictures, objects of art, ancient armour and tapestry, and also the library. The Bishop's Palace is a 17th-century building. Maison de Loin, built over a 13th-century crypt. Maison du Médecin, at number 8, Rue de Grand Cerf, is a beautiful specimen of Renaissance, with an inscription above the door showing that it was built by Claude Huvet, who was a doctor. Maison du Saumon, at number 10, Place de la Poissonnerie, was built in the 15th century and is the most curious construction of wood in Chartres. A big salmon is carved on one of its beams. The house of the old consuls in the Rue des Écuyers is interesting as the cradle of the city's municipal power and in possessing a most picturesque outside staircase turret, 16th century, now called the Escalier de la Reine Berthe. Many other houses belonging to the Middle Ages and Renaissance periods refresh the eye in walking through the streets of Chartres. The Porte Guillaume is the only survivor of the seven gates that formerly existed. It is flanked by two cylindrical towers of the 14th century with restored battlements. In going round the tree-shaded boulevards which mark the limits of the medieval city, Several sections of the ramparts can be seen, as well as a most attractive view of the cathedral over the river. On leaving Chartres, on the road to Orléans, almost immediately after passing a direction board, there is a fork where one goes to the right with the railway parallel with the road for a few kilometres. The huge, wheat-growing plain of La Beauce, the granary of France stretches away to a perfectly level horizon in all directions. Windmills are passed now and then, and distant villages can be seen, but more memorable than anything else is the great dome of sky, and as the car slips rapidly and smoothly along the white ribbon that cuts the scenery in two, one seems to be in the strangest of solitudes and on the very outermost surface of the globe, where every mood of the heavens is felt to its fullest without any mitigating influences. When it rains, every drop falls without hindrance and smites the face with a sting when driven by the untempered wind, and when the sun shines, every ray reaches the soil. Along is a roadside village roofed with thatch, coated with green velvet moss and having blind stone gables toward the road. Two level crossings succeed, and then Imonville, another stone village with great farmyards and a megalithic stone, is passed. At Alain there is a church belonging in part to the 11th century, and strips of low plantations begin to appear. 
It is noticeable that French advertisers use the corners of houses in the wayside villages for announcing their productions in blue and white, just where one looks for the blue and white direction boards so that the eye never fails to catch them and the various makes of cocoa or pneumatic tyres are engraved on the memory. Soon after passing a grey-green boarded windmill close to the road, which makes a very pretty picture against the emerald of the growing corn beyond, the road goes to the left and immediately afterwards to the right in the village of Artenay. Soon afterwards, a railway appears on the left, and with thin, rickety telegraph poles as companions, the rest of the way to Orléans begins to lose interest until a long, dull street shuts out the views. Like many cities boasting a history that goes back to a remote period, Orléans has rebuilt itself so often that it is now a modern town, with only a very few buildings to connect it with the past. All the atmosphere of antiquity pervading such cities as Rouen and Chartres has gone, to such an extent that it is with a mental effort equal to that of replacing the hippopotamus in the primeval marshes of the Thames where London now stands, that one remembers that the Gallic town of Senebum, which stood on the site of Orléans, was taken by Julius Caesar from the Carnutes in 52 BC. By the 3rd century the town was known as Aurelianus, from which it is an easy step to the present name. In 451, the devastating Huns under Attila were forced back. By 613, Orléans had become one of the most important cities in France, second only to Paris. It was frequently the residence of French kings, and money was minted there. In 1344, Philippe de Valois separated Orléans from the crown, and it became a duchy, and in the next century, came that historic siege by the English, raised by the maid who, clad in white armour, rode fearlessly at the head of the French army and sent a cold terror into the hearts of the English. Having been occupied by Leaguers and Huguenots in turn, Henri IV took the city in 1594. The year of Waterloo saw the Prussians in Orléans, and in 1870 they again occupied the city. They were driven out for a time, but after returning they did not evacuate until March 1871. The cathedral has its 18th century Gothic west front facing the wide Rue de Jean d'Arc. It is a most abominable conception of narrow pointed doorways of a Moorish character with the oddest pair of towers. The 13th century East End, with its great display of flying buttresses, is the chief portion of the earlier cathedral burnt by the Calvinists in 1567. Saint-Pierre-le-Poilier is the oldest church in Orléans. It is of unprepossessing appearance, but is interesting on account of the remains of the 9th and 12th centuries. Saint-Agnon was mutilated by Protestants in 1562. It is built over a crypt of the 11th century and consists now of transepts and choir only. saint Hubert is a flamboyant church, first built in the 12th but rebuilt in the 15th century. It has a tower of the 16th and 17th centuries. Notre-Dame de Recouvrance is an 11th century church, rebuilt in 1515 to 1519 and restored in 1862. The Hôtel de Ville is a Renaissance structure of modern aspect, built in 1530 for Jacques Crollo, Seigneur de Lille. Many French monarchs have stayed there, François II, Charles IX, Henri III and Henri IV, also Catherine de Medici and Mary Stuart. François II died there in 1560. In 1790 it became the Hôtel de Ville. The Bishop's Palace dates from 1631. The old houses are mainly to be found in the Rue de Tabour, a side street of great interest. The Musée Jean d'Arc occupies a charming 15th century house in the Rue de Tabour, known, without reason, as the Maison d'Agnès Sorel. 
The Maison de Jean d'Arc in the same street is the house in which Jacques Bouchier, treasurer to the Duc d'Orléans, received Jean during the siege of 1429. The room she occupied was unfortunately pulled down and rebuilt in 1580. The Hotel Cabou, not far from the Rue de Tabor, wrongly called Maison de Dion de Poitiers, is a Renaissance house built in 1540 and now contains the Musée Historique. The city walls, there are still a tower and a few fragments of the city ramparts. The Fête de Jean d'Arc is held on May the 8th in honour of the raising of the siege of Orléans by Joan of Arc. It is one of the most brilliant in France and has only been interrupted during the religious wars of the 16th century and from 1792 to 1804. And I think we'll leave it there for now as you drift off into a deep, relaxing sleep. Good night.